Yeah, it's a book I, I just had to write for this time, given what's going on with uh, maybe the greatest political and moral crisis in my lifetime, which is a long time, but really since the Civil War, I think. So I felt compelled to write this for this moment. Yeah, and it seemed to me that it was a little different in some ways from some of your other books. This, Your other books, you were often tackling... Uh, a particular problem and really critiquing it. Mm-hmm. And and this one, you're, you are critiquing a problem. And you state that very clearly in the subtitle, you're re- critiquing Christian nationalism. But what I loved was how much you're trying to point toward how Christianity can really be involved in this project of refounding democracy. Yeah. It, there's a very positive spin in this book. Yeah, uh, well, thanks for that. I, it's really true. I'm glad you started there because uh, there is a critique, strong summary of white Christian nationalism here, but there have been a lot of good books on white Christian nationalism. You've probably had people on your show. So it's more than that. It's saying, how do we... I, try, I took six iconic biblical texts and tried to reframe and refresh them for a Christian audience, but even a broader audience, uh, broader than even religious, and to say, how can we go forward here? How can we really deal with something that's a test of democracy, which more and more people are coming to see, but also a test of faith? And I think... Uh, we need not just politics here, but I call this a, a theology of democracy. And it's sort of like a, a, a spirituality or a s- civic discipleship here. And so I take these texts and uh, read some of your stuff, Diana, and some of these, and they're in the book. Uh, how do we reframe these gospel texts uh, to really help reshape, uh, contribute to the kind of multiracial, inclusive democracy we need. And also, at the end, I end with a chapter on what I call the remnant church, what a remnant church would look like. So it is trying to be positive and affirming. And uh, I think you've got to, every movement has to decide who, who they can persuade and who they have to defeat at the ballot box. And this, I'm, I hope, is a tool for both of those. Yeah, and I was really struck by that. You say that several times in the book and also in the promo materials um, that come with the with the advanced copies of the book. And um, I'm sure that you have the same experience that I do, and that is in the last four years, I've been asked the question more than I can even think, where people would say, how can I convince someone mm-hmm. to change their mind? Mm-hmm. And and so, it, it, do you really think that's possible still? I mean, you say that there are people who are persuadable. Yeah, I in my Georgetown class yesterday, we had a long conversation about that. Uh, there's students who uh, uh, are trying to deal with their own family. Thomas Merton once said, everything is about relationships. I think that's true. And so, uh, I don't look at persuadable constituencies more as who are the people who are sometimes oblivious and lost and stuck in their churches preaching a politicized nationalist gospel. I think I want them to hear the voice of Jesus. (laughs) Uh, Even when I left or got kicked out of my church, I never got shed of Jesus. And I really believe that Jesus' voice and presence remains. and, And there's while Jesus has suffered an identity crisis in America, with people using and abusing him, shouting Jesus' prayers as they take over the Senate gallery, I, I do trust, my whole life I've trusted this voice of Jesus that can bring us back. And so, uh, you know, um, I do think there are people out there who are hungry. Just talked to a mutual friend of ours, a young man today who was a, uh, New evangelical, post evangelical, adjacent evangelical. I'm not sure what they hope, but he's people are hungry, and I said, yeah, there they are. And so I want to reach out as much as I can to people who are hungry for something different and something new, and are, are not comfortable with what they're hearing every day. 
But there's also people who are very, very com committed to this false white gospel, this white Christian nationalism. And those people have to be defeated at the ballot box uh, this election year. Yes, they do. We we talk about that frequently at mm. the cottage. And it's so it's a balance, it almost seems like, between that act of friendship, persuasion, being willing to be in difficult conversations with folks who may be able to change their minds yeah. and that's that urgency about seeing how t how really dangerous this moment is and and you walk that line pretty carefully in this book i think ridney packnett who was one of the, the original Ferg ferguson leaders out in the streets um i quote her in the book saying okay uh, if you want to come in the streets with me and the rubber bullets and the tear, tear gas that's fine, but the cost, your risk, might be more talking to your family and friends uh, in ways that I can't. So, I mean, we've got, unless we achieve this inclusive uh, multiracial democracy for all of God's children, especially the most marginalized, Black, Brown, Asian American, uh, uh, LGBTQ folks or whose every, in, every initial names someone beloved of God, religious, non-religious, young, younger. Uh, uh, unless we can do that, I think, Diana, we might lose democracy altogether. Yeah. Unless we can achieve that inclusive, multiracial democracy. But there's this whole religious uh, factor, faith factor, which I think is a heresy. Heresies take us away from Jesus, and we have to come back to Jesus to overcome these heresies. And just just take the the word the phrase white white Christian nationalism white you know this is the most uh, inclusive open message in the history of the planet and they're making it white Christian they don't mean service they mean dominance and control and domineering and and nationalism the last thing Jesus said is now go and make disciples in every nation <laughs> so. It, its name spells the heresy, and I think just critiquing it isn't enough. We have to give people tools, and I've tried to with the scriptures and various uh, resources for those scriptures uh, to help bring us back to Jesus and to help uh, shape what a multiracial, inclusive democracy could look like and must look like. And when you talk about a heresy i think one of the the things that comes to my mind is that we've spent a lot of time talking about that um over the last several years how this is heretical why this is wrong and it's not just a heresy but there's also when her when you believe a heresy and you begin to lift it up that becomes idolatry it's well idolatry is the right word it's uh it's undergirded by an ideology of uh, of racism, which I make clear in the book. But the idolatry, it's false worship. It's right. worshiping false gods. And this Christian nationalism is, in fact, idolatrous. It's, it's, uh, it, it's worshiping other gods than the God of the Bible. And, and the, the, the lordship of Jesus, if we care about this, then we've got to deal with the false worship that is coming up, and it's politicized. It's aimed toward creating uh, an openness for authoritarian rule, for autocracy. Um, and so we see that happening every day, and we got to name it. We got to name it as something is theologically wrong and unbiblical, and I would just say antichrist. Named as antichrist. But then let's not just critique, let's help people find the way again find i mean for 50 years for my whole life i've been trying to keep coming back to what jesus said and keep helping draw others back to it as well and so i take these texts and they're very clear about what could bring us back yeah to that's what that's the piece that i wanted you to go with next so i'm glad you just sort of started segueing there because Okay, we know the problem, and there are some people that are just going to be committed to that no matter what is said, and that's what we have to defeat. Not the human beings, but the heresy and the idolatry has to be defeated because that's undermining democracy. 
Well, and then you, you, and then you, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Finish. Oh, I, I was going to say, and then you move to this idea of faith and democracy, civic mm -hmm. discipleship, and you talk about that from your own experience. And mm -hmm. then the the brilliant move of the book is taking six biblical stories and saying these are the key points in a, in civic discipleship. So can you list those six stories? Just just give us that whole list. I'm so glad you went there. Um, John 8, 32, Jesus says, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now he's not saying know the truth and don't lie as much because that's tough for powerful politicians and men in high organizations. He's saying, no, that without the truth, you're captive. Truth and freedom are indivisible. Uh, and we have so much disinformation, misinformation, and the outright lying of politicians now of a whole, one of our whole political parties is based upon a lie. Uh, this isn't just a faction, it's a whole party. And until we help people find the truth again, they won't be free. They're captive. They're stuck. So I do a whole thing on on John there, uh, and I love like you the, the the Good Samaritan parable, Luke ten twenty five thirty seven. The most important question for us in this democracy was asked by uh, Jesus. Well, asked by a lawyer who was really, in my view, a Washington lawyer. I can tell that tone of voice. And he said. <laughs> Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus gives the example of the Good Samaritan. Now, in Judean culture, there weren't any Good Samaritans. They didn't think there were any. And I quote you here from your sermon. Uh, that's who shows up as the hero in the story, the person that administered mercy to their enemy. So I say in this chapter, your neighbor likely doesn't live next door to you in America. And so they're trying to make everything into the other. And we're saying, no, this is our neighbor. And it's so clear, summation of the law, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, even love your enemies. So to me, that neighbor chapter is maybe my favorite one in the whole book. And then, you know, Genesis, first chapter, uh, first book in the Bible, Genesis one one twenty six. Let us make humankind in our own image and after our own likeness. Imago Dei. This is image of God, the foundation for every uh, action for human rights and for voting rights. So when they try and deny or suppress voting rights, which they do, as the North Carolina Supreme Court said, surgically aimed at people of color, that trying to to crush the voice and vote of people because of their skin color is actually an assault on Imago Dei. 